All right, Lady Ada, what is this? Hello, and welcome to the show and tell. We're here at the Ada Fruit Factory, and we're going to do our weekly show and tell like we do every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Me, Lady Ada, with me, Mr. Lady Ada. The factory's a little quiet, and we're going to be uh, hanging out as people from around the world come by and show us their, what they're making and then share it with us if they're 3D printing or sewing cosplaying or doing electronics or coding or crafting we want to see it so uh come by we're here for another 20 minutes we can get out of here at 750 so we can go on to our next show at eight o'clock we're gonna have some adafruit peeps and then uh some guests here so let's kick it off with phil b oh i'm first okay yeah. hi. hi um uh so you know i've been i've been collecting old computers um nothing super valuable just things i thought were kind of kind of interesting or neat um, this this week I have a um, Atari 800XL. Um, I did I did have um, a couple Atari computers as a kid, an earlier one and a later one than this. But um, I I pick this one as the one to collect because um, just the design of it. This is like so peak 1980s. You know, like if the yeah. 1980s collapsed into a singularity, it would be like like. Michael Jackson and Pepsi and this computer, right? Oh, and they probably were. There's probably some ads. <laughs> Maybe one of the Corys. Yeah. So um, I like the, I like the design of it, um, and I wanted to play you know the old games that I liked. But um, anyway, I learned an interesting thing when I was restoring this to working condition. When I got it, it was all full of worms, literally worms. It was gross. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned a cool thing because um, it, it didn't it didn't start up when I got it. Not because of the worms. Um, but you never know how am I going to troubleshoot this if, if there's like, is it, is it, you know, the CPU, is it the RAM or whatever? So what I learned is um, if it is bad RAM on these old, old computers, a lot of them use the same kind of RAM chips. You, you plug it in, you leave it running for like five minutes. You know, it's locked up. It's not going to work if the RAM's bad. But after a few minutes, um, if, if the RAM chips are bad, they get real hot. So you just you just go down the row touching them, and I found there were two two real hot chips. And you go on uh, jameco.com, and they have the uh, the 64 kilobit chips for a buck a piece. Swapped them out, and it started right up. And so uh, that was neat. I, I thought it was going to be this complicated thing to troubleshoot, and uh, no, it was real real easy to get this. Uh, actually, the worms were a harder problem than the bad RAM. So, I don't know what, what could sustain worms in there, but I like the resistors, the through-hole resistors are like the all in a row. They look great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's real pretty inside it the way it's beautiful called. design. Look at that. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. And I like the um there's the uh RF encoder up there in the top. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the um and I, don't, I don't have it here at my desk, but these things were just totally enclosed in a metal uh shell uh for, for RF reasons. Yeah. All right, well, yeah, XL, extra large for worms. Okay, next up, Scott. Hello. Uh, so I've been working on Circuit Python stuff because that's that's what I get paid to do. And uh, I, I was really inspired by the work that Nicholas Tollery did on Mew to internationalize it, meaning uh, making the strings in the program different languages so that people who don't speak English uh, can still understand what's going on. Uh, so I. I was inspired by that, and I actually added internationalization to CircuitPython. Um, so when you get error messages or some of the control messages, you'll get different things. So uh, let me just screen share. I have a terminal up, but I didn't want to be just a terminal. Um, so here you can see that uh, I have an itsy bitsy that I'm connected to, and I have done some REPL stuff previously, and you can see that the error messages are in Latin, which was, uh, it's a great placeholder. I didn't want to offend anybody with a bad translation with a, a language people actually, actually speak. So I did some Latin. And uh, so if I just go in here, I can control C and I get my messages all in the Latin based on the, on the uh, PO files. So if uh, people are interested, we can use uh, real people to help translate to real not dead languages. Um, if you're interested, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I just created an issue on GitHub for CircuitPython with instructions on how to do that. Um, so if you're interested and you want to help bring CircuitPython to folks who don't speak English as their first language, uh, please get a hold of us and, and help us out with this. 
Um, you get to translate really fun things like uh, break is not in a loop or whatever. Um, <laughs> lots of different stuff. So uh, yeah, we could use the help um, and it, it'll be really cool. All right, people who speak multiple languages, this is a good time. And then it supports Unicode. So even if it's non-Latin characters, which here is Latin in Latin characters, we support that as well. So that'll be cool to see, um, you know, languages that take advantage of the, the Unicode character set. Yep. And, yeah, uh, and, and there may be bugs around that. So we'll, we may need to squish those, but those are worth squishing. That's a great time to, to do it. All right, Ultima Vocatio. That's a... It's, um, it is, it's, it's best in the original Klingon, though. Yeah. All right. So you can do the Klingon. I tried to do Dothraki because I've been watching lots of Game of Thrones, but it it just like left w way too many words in it for it to be worthwhile. <laughs> yeah, they they weren't really big on coding. No, they weren't. It's a shame. It's the next next uh, next season maybe. All right, Nan Pedro. Hey, what's up, guys? Hi. Hi. Right. <laughs> so uh, today we released a new guide on the Adafruit Learning System. It's this guy here. This is a 3D printed rack and pinion, a reciprocating rack and pinion mechanism that's motorized. Uh, so it's kind of like a, a fun little desk toy. And I'm using the Adafruit Circuit Playground and the Cricut board to power the motor. Uh, so I have like a little speed controller program that I put together in uh, Microsoft's Make Code. So I can make it go faster. Kind of let things zoom around, slow it down a little bit. Also changing the brightness of the NeoPixel. So this is a 3D kit that folks can kind of download and 3D print themselves. Um, it's on the Adafruit Learning System, so you guys can check it out. It's this is pretty much all it does, but it's a it's kind of a fun mechanism, uh, and it's a little bit hypnotic too, in, in the sense that it kind of keeps moving back. I and forth. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of fun too. It like kind of keeps you looking with a little web feet and whatever. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty interesting little mechanism. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Looks great. Okay, thanks. So right, check out the guide and the video if you guys want to build one yourself. Yeah, we'll talk about that in the show. All right, next up, JP. Hey, guys. Hey. Uh, so I wanted to show what I'm working on for my uh, project for tomorrow's live stream, which is using our new neon tubes. So uh, you may have seen we've started selling these uh, LED strips that have this cool silicone uh, tubing that on one side looks an awful lot like a neon tube. Uh, so what I'm doing is driving them uh, via a Metro M0 uh, and a Darlington array. Uh, and I'm going to switch cameras here for a second so you can see. Here is one lit up. And what I'm going to do is I've got some buttons I can uh, hit here to turn on the center section. So I've got a couple more strips of it. And now another button will... Let me go to kind of blinky sign mode. And uh, I'm really impressed with, uh, this is actually only running on nine volts right now, but I may be running it in on 12 volts for the final, uh, but it looks great. And I found these strips are really easy to work with. Um, you can cut them and solder on, uh, cut the end off and then solder on additional strips. I've done that in one case. Uh, they bend really well without getting hurt. And uh, there's a little marking you can see, I think it's every three or every two uh, LEDs, there's a little black mark where you can cut pretty safely and still have solder pads. So I'll be showing all those uh, tips in a guide that'll be out on Friday. All right, thanks for the update, JP. Uh, all right, next up, JMK. Hello, thanks Hello. for waiting. What are you up to? So I don't know if I mentioned this, but Last time I went on, maybe I mentioned this, I think I did. Um, I said that I would make, I was working on making a Gemma M0 something. I forgot yeah. if I could do it or not. And so the batteries came and it's working and I charged them up. So I've got this on there. I could put it on. I'm not going to though right now. And so, um, I'm surprised that only 150 milliamps was eight and three, I mean, 3.7 volts, I thought it was obvious because it said that on the Gemma M0, but I didn't think the 150 milliamp battery is really fitting with this Gemma M0 because I saw lower capacity batteries being used on these. I decided, well, why not use this one? It fits the size perfectly and it will work in the 3D print that I'm going to do next. Hopefully we'll be here by next show and tell which is this whole enclosure in a good like case with like a 
uh, where is it? This thing on top to diffuse the light. Cool. Make it, make it all around. And um, the 150 milliamp battery runs it really well. I was like on almost all day today, like 12 hours. So yeah, I definitely recommend it. Recommend it if you want like a small battery that's okay. doing it. So the same program as last time. It's just the rainbow LED. However, I figured out the two pads I used. To, I had that were supposed to um make this red light, you know, the, just the normal indicator red light, turn on and off, no longer work. Maybe because there was some, like, um, conductive ink test I was doing on the back of it to those pads instead of conductive tape, just to test if that worked. But, yeah, from, it's the same program as last time, but now it works. So, yeah. Right. Good work. All right, well, come back next week with your 3D printed enclosure, and maybe you'll wear it, and we'll see it. Well. All right, thanks, JMK. All right, next up, Bryce and your magical Technicolor lab coat. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's what we've been working on. Um, I'm Bryce. This is my friend Michael. We've been working on this project uh, for the past couple of weeks. We've had the idea, like, a, a good, like, year and a half, two years ago. Um, we wanted to wear it to Dragon Con, uh, but just we haven't had the means or, like, the time to put into it until this summer. So. Okay. And especially once the we saw the Neo Pixelate come out, we were super impressed with that wing, and it really allowed us in, to, in, in the house. He wrote that code, so good. He's, yes. he's here to witness. It's it's a <laughs> life saving thing. I can't imagine trying to control this many pixels. And like we looked at fade candies and things, and these are the 144 pixel per meter strips. Yeah. So like the fade candy is very cool, but it wasn't the right. Choice. So we were really excited to see the Pixel 8 come out. Yeah, um, it allows us to not have to have a Raspberry on there or some computer. That's it makes it a lot more wearable, basically, instead of more of an installation where you can. Cool. Like, All right. So you got lots of strips, a lab coat, pixels. Yeah. yeah. So we got 10 meters on the coat, including some on the sleeve, which I need to cut the rest of the strips at the elbow so they have a joint. Um, and basically, we have this coat on here for now, just testing the standard rainbow coat and a couple different chases that we've been making. And then the plan is to make for Dragon Con, which is just Labor Day weekend, so just a couple of weeks. Uh, our minimum viable product is to have a little web app that we have running on it, so we can just connect and change patterns from our phone easily. Yeah, because we're using we're using the M0 Wi-Fi, so we're probably just going to grab the little one of the nice little Wi-Fi 101 web server examples and kind of make hey. a toggle button or something, uh, something easy. All right. Well, it looks good. You, yeah, you got a lot of options, and you got. It's good that you you're not doing this the day before. Yeah. yeah, we have, uh, <laughs> we gave ourselves a little bit of time. Plenty of time to get behind schedule. Kind of figure out engineering wise. All right. Well, well, this is a wonderful job. When you're uh, when you're done, I recommend documenting, sending it over. We'll blog it up because this is a common project that people want to build. And, yeah, uh, for sure. It was you know, uh, com and uh, we'll send you out two uh, seen on the show and tell stickers. So, sure. you're already headed the game. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great work. All right, and next Scott. Up, Scott. Other Scott. Hey guys, um, bringing back a project from a while back. You may remember the uh, yep. the skull that. Yay! Uh, yeah, he's back. Um, this was all written in Arduino code, and uh, I have decided that uh, I'm going to port all of my projects to Circuit Python. That's what we've been doing. Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah. So yeah. this is the, uh, the Circuit Python version. It's a little smaller. Um, it does the same thing as the other one is it checks in all my web servers and all my applications at the at the office to tell me everything's working. Um, but I went with, this is the same 8266 with CircuitPython. And rather than just using a regular web server, I'm doing a MQTT. So um, it's a little bit of a challenge to work with uh, a different technology like that. And I've still got some bugs to work through. But overall, it works uh, pretty well. And um, I'm happy with CircuitPython. So keep it Great. up, Scott. Other Scott, good work. Scott. Will be good work. Look at yeah, every. We're, we, um, we're going through some of our other projects that were pretty complicated to do. We have the uh, HAL 9000. When you press the button, it, it plays audio. It's a good project, but it's Arduino and it's like WAV files and like it's not really easy. And so with Cricut and Circuit Python, um, it's really easy. You just drag the files yeah. on and lots of iteration that you can do really fast. From a month long project, it turns into a half an hour project. Yeah. So, so uh, thanks for oh, thanks for doing that. Yeah, and then um, yeah, also um, post up your project, and we'd love to see it. it, it there's been um, requests for more um, Circuit Python Wi-Fi examples, so I think this would be a, a cool demo. Oh yeah, so, I'll, uh, I'll put some stuff together on that. Yeah, okay. send it over. We'll blog it up. Alrighty.
All, All right, right. Thanks, everybody. Um, email support at Adafruit, and you get a nice email on the show and tell sticker, of course. Boy or Skull. Yeah. All right. Well, let's show and tell for tonight, everybody. Um, we're here every single week, 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. We have Ask an Engineer at 8 p.m. Thank you so much, Scott, Scott and Scott, Scott, and Phil, Phil B, B, and Pedro, Pedro, Pedro JP, JMK, JMK, and, and Bryson Friend. Bryson Friend. Bye. And their bye coat. Bye. Uh, that coat is mesmerizing. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, everybody. Tune in See a couple minutes soon. for Ask Engineer. Bryce, can you stick around for just a minute? Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>